Dr. Zhuang, as the NIH director, I've been given the privilege over the past several years of being able to have a conversation uh, with the winner of the Lurie Prize. Congratulations on being this year's winner. And the work you have done is absolutely groundbreaking and fascinating. And we're going to get into talking about that a bit. The people listening to this uh, have a variety of different backgrounds, and they're not all scientists. So we'll try to be careful not to get too deeply into those uh, complicated jargon words. But people often also want to know a little bit about the prize winner in terms of what path this scientist has traveled to become so productive and have made this kind of discovery that gets recognized in this way. So I looked a little bit at your history and noticed, my goodness, uh, your PhD is not in biology, it's in physics. And that made me want to know, and maybe others would wonder as well, tell us a little bit about your own scientific path, how you got interested in science, and why was it physics? And then, hey, what happened after that that suddenly turned you into a biologist? Can you map out those steps for us? Yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, uh, Francis, uh, thank you so much. I know you're very busy. Thank you for taking your time to do this. And I really appreciate it. And uh, as you pointed out, uh, I was trained as a physicist. And uh, how come I uh, you know, picked physics as uh, my uh, PhD major? Uh, well, I even ever since I was a school kid, I always loved physics. You know, it's just, uh, you know, it's so simple and elegant. And then, it, you know, and then it explains, it has these simple and elegant physics laws that explains the universe. And then uh, when you learn about the subject, and then you just couldn't help appreciate the beauty of it and the elegance of it. And uh, I also like the fact that, uh, you know, I could reason things with physics. You know, I don't have to memorize a lot of facts. So uh, that makes the studying of uh, physics uh, really, uh, really appealing to me. So, so I did my uh, PhD in physics. And then uh, after that, when I was uh, uh, starting my postdoc in Steve Chu's lab, and uh, I was just ready to do something new. And then, and then I, I told Steve that, and then I said, uh, you know, how about we try something new? And I don't know what that new thing is. And then Steve said, oh, I, I'm now interested in biology. How about uh, we do something in, you know, biological research, biophysics? <laughs> and uh, I don't know much about biology at all. And I just said, well, why not? Let's do that. So. Sometimes things, you know, happen randomly and you don't plan for that. And uh, as I got into it, and I have to say that it just fascinates me because uh, in biology, there's so many things that are unknown, you know, it's like a, it's just like a treasure island, you know, lots and lots of things waiting to be discovered. And uh, it's so fascinating that, uh, you know, I just got into it and uh, and the rest is history as they say <laughs> so that must have been interesting I, I will tell you I'm resonating with what you're saying because um, when I was going through my experience of getting excited about science I thought biology was like way too messy and I like physics and I like chemistry my PhD is in physical chemistry my research was in quantum mechanics it was pretty much all mathematics and the idea of getting into biology, it just seemed a little scary because it was going to be so complicated. And it is, by the way. That was not a misunderstanding. But also, as you said, it's just full of this incredible potential. So when you made this sort of leap uh, from physics into biology, was there a little bit of it like, wow, this is just like really different. I can't just use some reasoning here to sort this out. This is like uncharted territory. Did it feel that way? Yeah, it really felt like there were just so many major important questions mm -hmm. and uh, waiting to be answered. And uh, you don't have to think hard to sort of identify an important question. It's just full of important questions. You know, our body is just still so mysterious to us. And right. uh, 
it, it, it has a great feeling of, uh, it's a gold mine for you to dig. So not an easy mine for you to dig, but it is a really great, you know, uh, great gold mine to dig, so. Indeed. So of all the nuggets uh, in the gold mine, uh, Zhao Wei, you migrate in the direction and have done amazing work in imaging. Why imaging? What was the what was the draw there that took you in that direction? You could have been a geneticist, and you sort of are, by the way. But imaging was apparently the thing that really attracted you. Yeah. So, as we often say, seeing is believing, right? So, <laughs> imaging allows you to see things directly, which really provides a truly compelling way of making discoveries. And also, you know, there's another important aspect, you know, different people using different ways to make discovery. And what I felt like is when I see something amazing, it, it brings me a truly remarkable feeling. And I still remember some of those, uh, you know, moments during the early stage of my career that got me hooked in imaging. You know, for example, as I said, I was a postdoc in Steve Chu's lab. And I were, when I first saw those single molecules under a microscope. You know, they're like twinkling stars in the night sky, you know, so mesmerizingly beautiful that uh, till today, I still remember, you know, the, the, the feeling of uh, how amazed I was. And another such moment I can give you, uh, sort of soon after I started my lab at uh, Harvard, and we got excited about looking directly inside the cells. And one of our first project is to study how viruses invade cells. Well, a fitting subject today. <laughs> so, yeah. so at that time, you know, we labeled these viruses with fluorescent dyes and added them to mammalian cells and watched them under, you know, using the imaging setup that we built. And then we see these viruses moving inside the cell, you know, dancing around and zipping through from the cell periphery to the perinuclear region and a rapid and directed movement on microtubules, uh, you know, releasing its genetic material by fusing with the endosomes, giving a burst of signal. It's an amazing movie to watch. I got so excited. I keep showing people that movie. So, uh, so you know, these were the moments that just got me fascinated and, and hooked with imaging. You know, it really feels great that we can see these tiny things invisible to our naked eye, you know, so clearly visible through our imaging instrument. You know, it's a really great way of making discovery. You know, as wow. Yugi Berra said, you can observe a lot by just watching, you know? <laughs> Thank you, Yogi. <laughs> so, and you not only were observing, you were observing at a level of resolution, just in terms of ability to see objects that people hadn't really been able to see with the light microscope before. Uh, there was this sense uh, over many decades, maybe centuries, that there was a limit in terms of exactly how much you could see in terms of microscopic detail because of the diffraction limit of light. And people would have said, well, that's just the way it is. And if you want to see something that's a finer detail, you've got to go to something else like electron microscopy. But you weren't satisfied with that. So, <laughs> and and that, that's a big leap to say that something that seems like a law of physics that's providing a barrier is maybe something you could work around. So how did you get that idea? And explain a little bit about how this field of super resolution microscopy has been able to achieve things that I wouldn't have thought possible. Yeah, so like you said, uh... It's a field, and then it's not just us. So, you know, I, I will explain to you our methods, the, the storm method, uh, you know, briefly. But I, uh, I would also like to uh, take this chance uh, to give a uh, general introduction of the field because uh, it's a field that a lot of people have uh, made contributions to develop methods, and even more people have used these methods to make biological discoveries. Mm -hmm. so, so I won't just focus on our own field, if, uh, I mean, our own uh, work, if that's, if, if that's okay with you. That's so, 
Entirely okay, and it's very generous <laughs> of you. And it's a good example of how scientists should behave, where we look across and see what our colleagues are doing and not just our own work. Thank you for all that. Right. All right, so then uh, <laughs> you mentioned the fraction limit. So uh, let me first start describing it a little bit so that we can sort of set the stage for these various uh, super resolution imaging methods that overcome the diffraction limit. And so the diffraction limit was uh, discovered by Ernst Abbey 150 years ago. And basically because uh, light is a wave, it's subject to diffraction. So when you focus it through light, you get a focal spot that has finite size. And even with the best objective in the world, the focal spot still has a finite size of about 200 or so nanometers. So what that means is if you image a, even a tiny object, no matter how small it is, even an infinitesimally small point, the image still has a finite size of 200 nanometer. That's why this image profile is also called point spread function. And now when two objects are close, uh, their distance being smaller than the width of the point spread function, their images would overlap so substantially that we can no longer resolve them. So to break this limit, we need to overcome the overlapping problem. And now we actually have several approaches uh, to overcome this limit. For example, we can use patterned light illumination and nonlinear optical processes to reduce the point spread function uh, as in stimulated emission depletion microscopy or STED and saturated structure illumination microscopy. Now we can also use single molecule switching and localization approach to overcome this limit. So here, what we do is we add a fourth dimension, you know, the time dimension to help solve the problem. So at any time, we only switch on a small fraction of molecules so that their images no longer overlap. Then we can pinpoint their position uh, with a, uh, such a high precision that is uh, much better than the diffraction limit, meaning by finding the center spot of the image. And then we can turn these molecules off, turn on a different subset, localize them, iterate this process until we determine all the molecular positions. And then we can put these positions together to reconstruct the image. Then the image is no longer having a resolution limited by diffraction. And it's actually just limited by how precise we can localize the, the, the molecules. And the methods like Palm and Storm falls into this category. And, uh, and you can even not just use switching, you can use binding and unbinding to achieve this goal of localizing a subset of molecules at a time like paint. Mm -hmm. And nowadays we could even use non-optical methods. We can expand the sample to a much bigger size uh, so that molecules originally separated by, you know, distance smaller than the diffraction limit are now separated by distance bigger than the diffraction limit so that we could resolve it by conventional microscopy as in expansion microscopy. So the list is long and growing and yeah. the resolution continues to improve. And now we can even achieve, you know, single digit nanometer resolution and a recently developed method called MinFlux can achieve one nanometer resolution. Whoa. So it's, so this it's just really opens a, up yeah, it opens up an entirely new window then of looking at cellular structures that used to be kind of a bit of a blur, and that was about it. That's <laughs> now right. Now you can actually see what's there. So, it, you, so what's you said, that like? Oh, you know, you, you said that exactly right. That uh, you know, the, the 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 reason why it is important is because biomolecules are small. You know, like proteins are often several nanometers in size. They can form these functional structures that are so small. And then uh, very often, if we use conventional light microscopy, you use the word blur. Indeed, they're, 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 they're just a blur. And uh, if you use uh, super resolution imaging to look at it, all of a sudden, that blur turned into a crisp image where you can see the interactions much better, and then you can have a much better understanding of the functional mechanism because the structure function are you know often related right so and you've discovered some completely new structures we didn't know were there like something you i think called the mps in an axon which 
just hadn't been noticed. <laughs> Is there a long list of those now of cellular structures that have emerged because of super resolution that nobody actually knew about? There are structures uh, that uh, people discovered. There are also systems uh, that we already know the structure, but the molecular inner works are less known. And then with the super resolution, now we can have a clearer view and then you can get better insights of you know, how these uh, structures function. So they're both categories. But like you said, you know, when you use super resolution, to discover a new structure that you didn't even know existed before, it really is a pleasant surprise, a really you know, very rewarding feeling like this uh, MPS structure that we uh, discovered yeah. before. So, uh, I mean, we discovered, I mean, it's, it's so surprising. I can tell you that well, we were just interested at that time to look at acting in synapses because acting is considered important for synaptic function or synaptic plasticity. And we just quickly turned away from synapses because we observed this beautiful period periodic pattern of acting in axons. And, uh, you know, it, it was not known before because uh, the acting form these ring-like structures, uh, you know, uh, underneath uh, the uh, the uh, the axonal membrane, uh, uh, sort of around the cir uh, circumference of the axons. But they're evenly spaced, and then the spacing about 180 nanometers, just shy of the diffraction limit. So it's smaller than the diffraction limit. So if you use a conventional microscope to see the structure, again, use your word, it's a blur. <laughs> But using store, we clearly see this periodic pattern, and then we just got drawn into it and then figured out that this pattern is because of acting rings connected by spectrum tetramers, and, uh, and then so on and so forth. Later on, we and other labs have made more and more discoveries about the structure and its function. It's, uh, it's really a uh, remarkable feeling, and it's, it's my favorite example of uh, how super resolution imaging proves to Yugi Barris, you know, saying of you can observe, observe a lot by uh, just watching. With new eyes. And, with you new know, eyes. Was it, you know, provided that, those. Yeah, with a new set of eyes. <sighs> you know, indeed, super resolution imaging enabled uh, uh, other discoveries and provided new insights into so many biomolecular systems. Uh, and I won't time to enumerate them all here. It's just uh, uh, a remarkable, like, booming field. Indeed. Well, tell me um, a little more about another area that you've worked on, uh, which is genome scale imaging, where you're looking at actual gene expression, which everybody's interested in, because that kind of tells you what a cell is up to. And what you really like to know is what's a single cell doing and what, uh, what RNAs is it actually expressing? And You've come up with a way that I'm still trying to understand uh, to be able <laughs> to look at maybe more than 10,000 different RNAs in the same cell, which I would have thought, there's no way you have that many labels. So how does that work? Yeah, so I think you're referring to uh, the Murfish method. I am indeed referring to Murfish, <laughs> although I've forgotten what it stands for. All right. so. Uh, so let me explain uh, that a little bit, but then later on, I will also say that uh, uh, the genome scale imaging also has some multiple different approaches. So, so I will expand from there to other approaches. Uh, I mm -hmm. mean, actually, let me start by saying this so that uh, you know we uh, don't forget that it is a field, active field, that there are many researchers uh, making contributions, you know, like, like super resolution uh, imaging. If you want to achieve genome scale imaging, meaning that image uh, uh, molecules at the genomic scale, thousands of them, how do you achieve them? You can also achieve them by multiple different approaches. And then if I use RNA as an example, and uh, how do we achieve single cell transcriptome imaging? You know, one, there are two major categories of approaches. And uh, one category is using in situ sequencing. And then there's actually a number of innovative in situ sequencing methods that have been developed, uh, uh, such as ISS, Physique, 
you know, star map and the list goes on. And uh, there's another category of approaches uh, called multiplex to fish. Uh, fish stands for fluorescence in situ hybridization. There are also different to multiplex fish method being developed, uh, such as merfish and seek fish. So then with that backdrop, I will go into tell you the background, and then uh, I will go into tell you exactly what merfish is, because it's a really cool method. And uh, it's a uh, method uh, that massively multiplex single molecule fish. And the, and the single molecule fish is a method that allows us to image individual RNA molecules uh, with hybridization probes and localize them and count the copy number. And then if you want to image multiple different kinds of RNA molecules, use multicolor imaging. And if you want to use that, if you want to image thousands of them, like you said, I don't have thousands of colors, right? What do you do? And the other way of thinking is I can image one at a time. Uh, I image, I extinguish the signal, I label another kind, I image, I do it a thousands of times. Oh, and then the and cell's really, the cell's really dead by then. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's like a definitely not really uh, practical. So, so how do we, uh, you know, achieve genome scale imaging. Now imagine you can barcode the RNA molecules. Say we, uh, for example, we assign binary barcodes to the molecules. Each uh, gene has a distinct barcode, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, one, zero, one, zero, and so on. And then in the first round, we label and image those genes that the first bit reads one, but not zero and uh, extinct sig the signal. And then in the second round, we label and image those RNAs, their second bit reads one, but not zero and an extinct the signal. And then we can sort of after n rounds of imaging, you can do the math and calculate uh, how many different kinds of genes now you can distinguish. Oh, first of all, imagine that we're still doing single molecule imaging, okay? So after n rounds of imaging, we see many, many single molecules, many, many dots inside the R, uh, cell. And each dot has a string of binary barcodes associated with one, zero, one, zero. Mm -hmm. And then you ask after n bit imaging or n rounds of imaging, how many different RNAs you can distinguish? Two to the nth. Exactly. It is that exponential <laughs> power that is so powerful and great that allow us to identify thousands of RNAs or thousands of genes with relatively few rounds of imaging. So what, 15 or 16 rounds, something like that, and you pretty much looked at the transcriptome, huh? Exactly, with 16, you calculated right to two to the 16, <laughs> more than 60,000 is the whole transcriptome. But I yeah. have to say that there, there is a challenge so we typically cannot get to the whole transcriptome with 16 rounds of imaging. And the challenge is because uh, uh, error accumulation. Per oh. bit imaging, there's very small error, but the error accumulates, okay? So you need redundancy, right? So exactly, we need actually what we call error robustness, or we need barcodes that can actually detect error and correct error. That's how we solved this error accumulation problem. And that's why we call the approach multiplexed uh, error robust uh, fluorescence in situ hybridization. Ah, okay. That's the ER. Okay, got it. <laughs> but so like this... I said, you know, in, in, in the, in, in, in the, as in the case of super resolution imaging, Genome scale imaging is also a field that has been established through the effort of a number of labs. Mm -hmm. So while I feel fortunate to receive the prize, uh, I feel the prize actually recognized the advances uh, in these fields, not just effort in my lab. And this presumably is now being put into the efforts to define the human cell atlas, uh, where we are trying to understand just how many different human cell types are there. How do you know what's a different cell type? Well, look at its transcriptome. That would be a good place to start. And of course, a lot of people are doing this more with static analyses. My lab does a lot of single cell RNA-seq, but we don't actually get to see what that looks like terms of where those transcripts are located. So that takes you to a whole nother level. 
Is this scalable? Is it the sort of thing where you could imagine doing this on large numbers of human cells uh, to begin to play out some higher version understanding of what the cell atlas for the human body should look like? Yeah, absolutely. It is a scalable approach. So we can uh, really image millions in, you know, of cells or even more, you know, than you know, for, for some of the regions or tissue types, uh, uh, tissue regions, you know, we, we focus on the brain, you know, for, for some certain brain regions uh, we often image uh, hundreds of thousands of cells or millions of cells. And of right. course, you could imagine that uh, if you have, uh, uh, keep developing the approach or uh, having multiple labs or working on it, uh, then it is a pretty scalable approach that allow you to really look into large tissue volumes. Uh, and as you said, uh, uh, a lot of the labs uh, do this uh, by uh, sequencing-based approach, uh, such as uh, single cell RNA sequencing or single cell epigenomic sequencing. These are absolutely powerful approaches that allow you to identify new cell types and then study the molecular basis of them. Uh, but the imaging-based approach offers uh, some additional uh, merits, and uh, that's because uh, we can actually use imaging-based uh, single-cell genomics approaches to image intact tissues. We don't have to dissociate cells from tissues. And then we can profile the gene expression of individual cells in intact tissues, identify mm -hmm. the cell type that allow us to directly map out the spatial organization of different types of cells in tissues. And that gives you the uh, spatially resolved cell atlas uh, you know, uh, of tissues. And then the spatial organization is often important for tissue function. Oh, incredibly so. I mean, think about the brain. It'd be great to have a cell atlas, but to have a cell where you know what's neighboring to what. <laughs> That's exactly, where, really you know, where they are things. located, how they yeah. interact, uh, yeah. What's their, you know, local environment, you know, things like that. And, and, and they're very complementary, the sequencing-based approaches and imaging-based approaches. Mm -hmm. And uh, I should also say that in the spatial genomics area, there's not just imaging-based approaches. There are also these approaches that you capture the RNA in a spatially resolved way and then sequence them as in uh, spatial transcriptomics or slice seq and so on. So these are all complementary approaches that hopefully will give us uh, a spatially resolved cell atlas uh, of various tissues. And they, you know, sequencing based approach and imaging based approach has already been used together, helping each other in a complementary way to study a variety of different tissues like the brain, the heart, developmental, em uh, development embryos and so on. So yeah. it's just a remarkably rapidly expanding, exploding field. It, all of that. I mean, 10 years ago, could I have imagined that this kind of technology would be actually available? It would be applied at scale as we begin to sort out something like the brain. Oh my gosh, it's come along very quickly and probably much more to come. Uh, and that's the way it should be. And uh, well, let me, I, we probably need to uh, wind this up. I could talk to you for hours. <laughs> yeah, I imagine <laughs> the people listening to this are like, okay, how long is this going to go? So uh, let me just ask you a couple more final questions. First of all, congratulations to you on this Lurie Prize. And I know, uh, Zawe, you have won a number of other significant prizes, like the Breakthrough Prize in, in 2019. Uh, what about the Lurie Prize? What does this mean to you? Is this like uh, one more to sort of put on your CV, or is it something? Like <laughs> well, it's, it, it, it is really a truly great honor to win the Lurie Prize. So, uh, I would say that it not only means a lot to me, it also means a lot to my lab members. And as we all know, these uh, young graduate students and postdocs, yeah. they are the true heroes behind the success of a lab, right? And yeah. I think the prize honors them too. But moreover, as I mentioned, uh, we're not the only lab working in super resolution imaging or genome scale imaging. In both areas, there are other labs who make great contributions uh, to the development of uh, powerful approaches and even more labs uh, using these approaches to make biological discoveries. Uh, so I think the prize uh, also recognizes uh, these exciting fields uh, 
and the many scientists working in these fields and to recognize their contribution to biomedical sciences. And that's, again, I think a wonderful way uh, to talk about why prizes matter. It's always tempting, I think, for people to focus in on the person, but usually it's the person who's part of a community. That's how science works. So, so finally, let me ask you, if there was a young person who's listening to this and maybe thinking about what they want to do with their own career and maybe contemplating uh, getting into biomedical research, what would you say uh, to that person about their opportunities right now? Well, I would say it's a really exciting time to get into biomedical research. And uh, there are many new and uh, interdisciplinary approaches that have made this already important and exciting field just even more exciting now. So for young people who are trained with a biological background, uh, I would like to encourage that you keep your eyes and mind open for these new cross-disciplinary approaches so, so that you can harness their power for your research too. But also for people who are not trained as a biologist, as I was not trained as a biologist, right? As you know. So uh, if you're interested in biomedical research, don't be afraid of getting into this new territory because your background uh, training in physical sciences uh, in, or computation or engineering or other areas uh, could give you a special aid, edge, yeah. I'm sorry, <laughs> a special edge that allow you to invent new approaches to tackle biomedical problems that were not previously accessible. And uh, that would enable a new, whole new set of discoveries so it's, it's just a remarkable, exciting time. And uh, you know, for young people to go into biomedical science. That's a perfect answer and certainly resonates uh, with me that we're in this sort of golden age of discovery for life sciences. And congratulations to you for the contributions you have made to that golden age already. And I guess there's gonna be a lot more to come. I'd be willing uh, to bet there are things you're going to be doing over the next uh, 20 or 30 years that you and I and nobody else has quite thought of yet. And what an amazing time it is to be part of those kinds of adventures. So one more time, congratulations, Zhao Wei, uh, and thank you for explaining all of this uh, in this uh, brief conversation. I've really enjoyed it. And really glad that the Alluri Prize folks uh, came up with such a great selection for 2021, regardless of COVID-19. Someday, I hope uh, you and I'll be in the same place and we can have an even longer conversation because I'd love to hear more. But thank you very much uh, for your work and congratulations. Well, thank you, Francis, for this great and fun conversation. And then I also would like to take this uh, chance to thank uh, uh, Anne Lurie and uh, the Foundation for NIH again for establishing this uh, prize to honor uh, scientists. Here, here.